Good morning. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> the day went fast, but not that fast. <laughs> Good evening. We have the privilege of gathering again, to gather again as brothers and sisters in Christ, to gather under the Word, to be encouraged, to be challenged, to be built up in the image of Christ. Um, this morning, we talked about Christ is coming, and we should expect it and be ready. And this evening, we're talking about judgment, the fact that God will judge the world. And this morning's call to worship was Psalm 96, which ends with this statement that God is going to judge with equity. Well, in this evening, our call to worship is Psalm 98. God's judgment is a theme for these psalms in this section. And here are these words from verses 7 through 9. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord. Why? For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. In our world where judgment is so often twisted or skewed, whether by outright sin or by our own misperceptions, we have this hope that in the end, God will do it justly and rightly. And he will be praised for that. Let's take a moment of silent prayer to prepare our hearts to enter into this time of worship. Let us pray. I invite you to turn in your gray hymnals to 237 as our opening hymn. We praise you, O God, 237.
greets you here this evening. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the sevenfold spirit before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. At this time, we're going to confess our faith using the words of Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer one. It's page 861 in the back of the gray hymnals, if you would like the words. People of God, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation because I belong to him. Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Amen. Let's continue singing with number 193. 193. That last line of that hymn, um, lift your voice in singing, for with you has come to dwell in your very midst the great and holy one of Israel. And we think of Jesus' words, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also. And he is here among us. I invite you to turn to Psalm 4. As we read our way through the Psalms, we have 528 in the Pew Bibles. Oh. Psalm 4. Answer me when I call to you, O my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. How long, O oh men, will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call to him. In your anger, do not sin. 
When you're on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and trust in the Lord. Many are asking, who can show us any good? Let the light of your face shine upon us, O Lord. You have filled my heart with greater joy than when their grain and new wine abound. I will lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. The Lord has set apart the godly for himself. And he delights to hear our prayers. Are there any prayer requests, praises, or thanksgiving? Our Abba Father delights to listen. We want to be continuing to pray for Linda's brother, Ed. The stem cell treatment transplant was a success at Mayo, but he was supposed to come home two weeks ago, and they're not allowing him to go home because he can't eat or drink, and they have to sort that out before he's allowed to come home. We'll be praying for Linda's brother, Ed. all the the harvesting going on we give God thanks for the abundant crops he's provided and we pray for safety in the, the work I'm going to pray for our country in particular um, the, the work and the labor situation where there's a lot of short staffed companies and there's a lot of workers putting in a lot of hours and the the medical is a lot in that as well so we want to pray for the nurses and people who work in medical in our congregation as well as long as all the others who are working the long hours and are just getting tired Thankful for the beautiful weather and for God's faithfulness in sending the seasons one after the other. Okay. Let us come to our God in prayer. Lord, you have filled our heart with greater joy than the joy that those who don't know you have when everything in their life is going swimmingly. We thank you for the hope and the joy we have in Christ Jesus, that knowing in and through him we are adopted, that we are justified and we are being sanctified and will certainly be glorified, brought home to you. Lord, may we lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O oh Lord, make us dwell in safety. 
Lord, this is our hope when life is hard, like it is for Linda's brother Ed right now, dealing with a successful stem cell treatment, but the nausea that's so bad he can't eat or drink anything. Lord, sustain him, encourage him in the midst of this struggle. May he feel you with him, holding him fast. We pray that you give the, the doctors and wisdom and insight, the knowledge they need to seek to help treat the symptoms he's dealing with. Encourage his family. This is disheartening to watch someone you love struggling so much and so long. We pray for those in our congregation who are dealing with poor health. Whether it's growing older and parts of your body not working as well as they used to, or it's cancer like Todd Vannermullen. Encourage him and his family. We give you thanks for good reports right now. and Pray for continued strength and good reports. Lord, and he gives thanks that he's able to participate in the harvest right now. Heavenly Father, we pray for Joyce Starr as she deals with her body failing, having to move at an indetermined time when her room comes open at the cottages. Lord, give her grace and strength and encouragement. We pray for the other, others who aren't able to join us regularly. Think of Jerry and Rita Veenstra, Nancy Bruxford. Rachel Vandermolen, Joyce Starr, Marsha Wout, Marsha DeYoung, Ruth Vanderhart, and Marilyn Vanderlinden. We give you thanks for them. We pray that you would guard and keep each one of them. Hold them fast, Lord. May we not forget them. Heavenly Father, we pray for our country, in particular the, the economy and the dynamic we find ourselves in where so many employers would love to hire more workers and can't or find them. And the workers who are there are being asked to work more and more hours and are growing tired. I mean, especially think of uh, those who work in the medical field right now. And some of them are growing tired, Lord, with the extra shifts they need to pick up. and Just a weariness that seeps into the soul, even. Lord, guard and keep and encourage them. We pray that you would give our government wise policy to help correct the situation. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this beautiful weather for an abundant harvest that you provided, that it can be the time of reaping that which was sown in the spring. Lord, it gives such joy to hearts to finally be able to go into the field and bring in the crop that has been watched grow all season long. We pray you give strength and endurance and alertness to those who are harvesting. Protect them. Give them safety. Give them what they stand in need of to bring in the bounty that you have provided. Lord, we thank you that you are faithful from one season to the next. And as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. Lord, may we be encouraged by your steadfast faithfulness and continually look to you that we might be ready for your return. Heavenly Father, as we take an offering this evening for World Renew, we pray for this organization that seeks to provide diaconal help in the name of Christ. Or we give you thanks that they're able to restart some of their programs now. And it looks like DRS, the Disaster Response Services, will 
We'll start sending out teams again this year. We pray for wisdom and guidance as they do so. We pray for the other ways they're working to to minister to the hungry, to those who are struggling with injustice, to the weak and the downtrodden in the world. And we thank you that we can participate in this work through our offerings. May you take our gifts and use them mightily to your glory that many might turn to you because they see glimmers of your love and your justice and your truth and your joy in the hands and the feet and lives of the believers who reach out to help. Lord, may we exemplify that as well in our lives. We pray all this in Jesus' precious name. And God's people said, Amen. Our offering this evening is for World Renew. As we prepare to come to God's Word, I invite you to turn in Grey Hemnal to number 209. Seek ye first the kingdom. 209.
working our way through the Heidelberg Catechism in the evenings as a, a framework to cover what is it that we know about God and what is He revealed to us. We're looking at Lord's Day 4 this evening. It's page 864 in the back of the gray hymnal. And I invite you to join in on the answers. But doesn't God do us an injustice by requiring in his law what we are unable to do? No, God created humans with the ability to keep the law. They, however, tempted by the devil in reckless disobedience, robbed themselves and all their descendants of these gifts. Will God permit such disobedience and rebellion to go unpunished? Certainly not. He's terribly angry about the sin we are born with, as well as the sins we personally commit. As a just judge, he punishes them now and in eternity. He has declared, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. But isn't God also merciful? God is certainly merciful, but he is also just. His justice demands that sin committed against his supreme majesty be punished with the supreme penalty eternal punishment of body and soul. Amen. We're also going to read from the minor prophet Nahum, page 906 in the Pew Bibles. Nahum. Jonah, Micah, Nahum. We're going to look at Verses 2 through 8. Before we read God's word, let us pray. God, our Heavenly Father, we are unable to hear your word accurately without your Holy Spirit opening our minds and softening our hearts. And so, Lord, we pray your Spirit would move here among us, preparing us as a good seedbed for your Word, that we might be shaped more and more in the image of Christ, our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. Nahum. Starting at verse 2. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and maintains his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and it dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither, and the blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountains quake before him, and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence. The world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. The Lord is good. A refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in Him. But with an overwhelming flood, He will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue His foes 
into darkness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. beginning of the service, I talked about justice and how in our world justice is so often distorted. This is a reason why there are Christians in our country who, even though God gives the government the power of the sword, are opposed to capital punishment. Because in practice, in our country, those who get executed are those without the resources to appeal and find a different sentence. And because of the inconsistency, the inequity of our justice system in bringing the severest consequence of the death penalty... They say, we shouldn't do it because we are unable to do it rightly, unlike God. And it's because we see the human injustice around us that we ask questions like that posed in question nine of the Heidelberg Catechism. Well, God, he's doing an injustice because... We tell ourselves we're sinners and there's no way we can keep the law. So how on earth could God be just and punish us when he knows that we can't do it? When we will fail. To put this argument in a slightly different perspective, think of it this way. Can we go to a baby and get frustrated with them for not talking in full sentences? No, they're not biologically developed to be able to speak, to know how to use language yet. That would be unjust. They're just not capable of it. Or do we, we ask our 10-year-old to just hop in the car, go to town and get groceries? Well, in our country, they're not allowed to legally because they're not allowed to have a driver's license yet. Or could we be frustrated with a fifth grader for not being able to do advanced calculus? In their case, they haven't developed the critical thinking skills and let alone studied the material to be able to do it yet. In each of those cases, it would be unjust. It would be an injustice to get frustrated with that baby for not speaking in sentences. For that 10-year-old not to just drive to town by themselves. Or to have that 5th-year-old, 5th grader do calculus at a college level. That's how our world often thinks about God punishing sin. Oh, acknowledge that, you know what, I'm not perfect. I can't be perfect. It also comes up when we learn that, you know, we're in this state because of a choice Adam and Eve made, and I never had anything to do with that. So why am I being punished for what they did way back then? Isn't this an injustice? I mean, we can't help it that, as Psalm 51 puts it, we're conceived in sin. We're born this way, to use the title of a modern pop song. So shouldn't we just live this way? The catechism points us back to the beginning. It reminds us that No, we weren't supposed to be this way. In fact, we are guilty as charged. 
to, to, to shift to a financial image, the children of parents on their parents' debt are often saddled with, or the parents' death are saddled with the parents' debt. They have to get it paid off. They have to find a way to make it go away. It's their problem now that mom and dad died. Well, in this case, when Adam and Eve sinned, when they chose to turn their backs on God, they set each one of us on a path as their descendants with a default setting of being facing away from God and in rebellion from God. So we have this debt from Adam and Eve to start with, and then, as we've all admitted, we sin. We don't pay it off. We add to it. So does God do an injustice? To hold us to account for sinning? The biblical answer is no. He doesn't. And in fact, he can't just be lenient about it either. That's really what question 10 is getting at. Can't God just kind of look the other way? Boys will be boys. They tried. We'll just let it slide. As we read... In Nahum, this is why I picked this passage from Nahum. We have this image of God who is way beyond our conception. Who is way more holy, way more powerful, way more impressive than we can wrap our minds around. I mean, we look at the thunderheads. When they come through and they got the flat top and that flat top's at like 40 or 50,000 feet up. Well, our God's so big, that's just the dust from under his shoes. His holiness is so great. that he can't tolerate sin. It's an affront to his very nature. The thing about our sin is it is not giving God his due. God, as great and awesome and glorious as he is, deserves our all. Our joyful obedience. Our delighted submission to him. And when we instead give him half-hearted obedience or even turn our backs and rebel, we're saying, you're not as good as you actually are. You're not worth it, Lord. Actually, I'm more important because I want to do this and whatever you think doesn't matter. I'm going to do it. I'm greater than you in my own eyes. That is what our sin is. It's robbing God of the glory that is his due. And we can't get away with it. We take this and we have a debt to God because of our sin. Now, let's use a different illustration about the cost of sin. And the cost of forgiveness, actually. If you were to have, I think I've used this illustration quite a while back, but if you had a guest come to your house and you had a a lamp on the end table of your couch, and through their carelessness or just their spite, they smashed it and broke it, suddenly you have less light in your living room, as well as no lamp. And you have a couple different options going forward. One, you can say to them, pay up, you need to replace that lamp. 
Another option is to, no, I'll bear the cost. I'll forgive you and I'll pay for a new lamp. But there's a third option too. That's just to say, you know what, it doesn't matter. I can live with a darker living room. And just do without the lamp. Well, when we look at who God is and His holiness, and how He cannot tolerate sin, that last option of just doing without the light, doing with just a little less holiness in the world, isn't an option for God. The cost must be paid. And the glory of the gospel is that Christ will pay it on our behalf. But if we don't put our trust in Him, we're still on for the tap. And because God is so great and His dignity so limitless, the payment takes the rest of eternity. We tolerate sin we are lenient with sin in our lives because we make light of it we don't grasp just how big god is how perfect and glorious he is and so we go about our lives thinking not too much of our sin while our I, muffed up again, whatever. But Jesus wants to impress on us to take our lives seriously. He even goes as far as this in Matthew chapter 12. Verse 36. I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word spoken. God isn't lenient towards sin because sin is serious. And we need to wrap our minds around that more and more and pray that the Holy Spirit would help us to see sin in all its gravity so that we might flee from it and avoid it and cast ourselves in, to, before God in abject repentance when we fall, pleading to Christ again, forgive me for making you little through my careless sinning. See, God is also merciful. But His mercy and His justice don't cancel out. But rather, we find them meeting on the cross of Jesus Christ. <laughs> the end, I think, of Psalm 84, it says, Righteousness and peace kiss each other. God's righteousness, His truthfulness, His holiness, and peace, His shalom, His goodness, kiss on the cross. And it's only through the cross of Jesus Christ that we, people who are sinners, people who do not measure up, can be brought into God's mercy. Because there, Jesus suffers the full wrath of God that we read about there in Nahum. That fierce anger that destroys the rocks. And it's like fire pouring out over the land. Destroying everything in its way. And that is what Christ endured on the cross for you. Out of love. That when we look to Jesus with repentance and faith, the debt is paid. 
Because He paid it for us. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. And on Christ, on the cross, Christ got what we deserved so that God might not give us what we deserve. Which is eternal punishment. And because Christ did it in love, not only do we get mercy, not what we deserve to get, but we also get what we do not deserve. We get the abundant life in Christ. We get the joy of new life. Of the ability to, to, to look to Him as often as we sin. And say, Lord, I messed up again. Please help. And He picks us up. And sets us on our feet again. And strengthens us through His Word. Through the Lord's Supper. Through His Holy Spirit in us. And enables us to continue on the path. And as Paul puts it in Philippians 1 verse 6. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion in Christ Jesus. See, our sin is still serious. I invite you to turn to Revelation chapter 20. Verses 11 through 15. Revelation 20, starting at verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead. Great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and the death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. At that judgment, there are these books open. The books of our lives. What have we done? And it's revealed that we don't deserve salvation based on our books that we have written. But what we see is there is another book, the book of life. The book of those who put their faith in Jesus Christ and have his merits attributed to them. And they're brought to salvation. God does not do an injustice, punishing sin. He does not do an injustice by not being lenient toward us. And He does not diminish His mercy by punishing sin. We're called to look to Christ. This past week in the, the White Horse Inn, there was an interview, and they were talking about the gospel according to Satan. All these little things that Satan is telling our society. and They sound good, but he twists them. And one of these lies that Satan has gotten many people to believe in our world is YOLO. You only live once. And this author, I don't remember his name. If you're interested, I could find it for you. But he said, as Christians... We have to insist on this. You can either live once and die twice. Or you can die twice and live once. Now what's that getting at? We can humbly acknowledge 
our sin and repent, dying to it by looking to Christ in this life. And then we'll discover that when we die, we are in eternal life with Christ forever. But if we refuse to acknowledge the seriousness of our sin here and now, if we refuse to die to it, we will die. And then as we just read in Revelation 20, we'll find that we face a second death. An eternity in hell. As just punishment for the sin we refuse to acknowledge as weighty or worthwhile repenting of. And so in the meantime, as we wait for Christ to come again and bring his justice equitably, we're called to point people to Christ and beg them to die again to their sins. That they might not die for eternity in hell. May each one of us here do that. Looking to Christ as the one who has borne the just wrath of God against our sin. Let us pray. Holy God. It is so easy for each one of us here in the very ordinariness of our lives. To start to view our sin lightly. Do not take it seriously. God Almighty, we pray you would guard us against this. That you would humble us. And look, make us look to Christ. That we might not be lost for eternity in the second death. Lord, help each one of us here to die to ourselves, to die to our sins, and look to Christ that we might have eternal life in Him. Holy Spirit, soften our hearts. Strengthen us to live righteously before You and joyfully and seriously point others to to Christ because of their need for Him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our world does not like God's justice. Psalm 2 talks about them trying to throw off God's fetters. And God's response is to laugh and install Jesus Christ as His King. We're going to sing Psalm 2 this evening as our song of response, number 2 in the Grey Hemnal.
doxology, I invite you to turn to 593. We're going to sing verses 3 and 5 of 593. But as you go out from here to love and to serve the Lord, go with God's blessing. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead the Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will and work in us what is pleasing to him through Christ Jesus, to whom be the glory now and forever. Amen. Verses 3 and 5.